morning. Good morning. I'm Chad Stebbins from the Institute of International Studies, and it's my pleasure to welcome our speaker today, Dr. Jonathan Dresner, an associate professor of history at Pittsburgh State University, where he is beginning his ninth year. He's originally from Maryland, has also lived in Hawaii and uh, Iowa. Um, his specialty is uh, more Japan than Korea, but uh, if you've studied uh, Japanese history at all, you know how closely it is intertwined with Korean history. So we owe a debt of gratitude to Dr. Paul Tevereau, who recently retired from the history faculty here for uh, introducing us to Dr. Dresner. And he is speaking on a, a very important topic, North Korea, the, um, I, I love his, his uh, presentation title, Hangover of the 20th Century. Um, please join me in welcoming Dr. Jonathan Dresner to the stage. Oh, good morning. Um, as a historian, I'm not used to my lectures being so immediately newsworthy. Uh, so, so, so uh, uh, I, I'm, I do follow current events fairly closely, uh, but um, it doesn't usually become quite so, so uh, directly connected. The, uh, one of the reasons why I do history and why I think history is, is so much uh, so, fun, so much fun and important, is that we are, in a lot of ways, historical beings. We think historically. We think in terms of stories. We think in terms of how we got here. And how we think about our history affects how we think about ourselves. And this is not just true for individuals. It's also true for nations and states and governments. And so the, the question when we talk about history, sometimes, very often actually, isn't what happened. So much as, of everything that happened, what matters? And so the perspective that you take on the history affects greatly how you see the present, how we got to the present, and how we think the present will go. And this is I think particularly uh, in the case of North Korea, there is a reasonably well-known, I think, uh, at least among, among scholars who study North Korea, but a reasonably well-known pattern to the history that North Korea takes very, very seriously. And while I'm not trying to present the North Korean view here, uh, that, that's not uh, exactly my, my intent, um, nonetheless, uh, the elements that I, that I want to talk about today definitely do figure into that, uh, that perspective. The history I want to talk about is, roughly speaking, the 20th century. I, 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 there's a little bit of 19th century in there uh, right at the beginning, and obviously I'll try to bring it up as close to the present as I can manage without losing my historian license. Um, the, uh, the two components of the history that I think are uh, fairly critical for understanding this are imperialism and uh, nuclear weapons, weapons of mass destruction. Uh, the North Koreans see in brief, and then I'll go through it obviously in detail, but the North Koreans see themselves as stuck between empires. Uh, Korean history over the course of the last century, century and a half basically, uh, has been about trying to negotiate their position as a relatively small country in the middle of uh, large powers and, and of interest to large powers. And this is, this is, this is just a, a sort of a general, a general map, but obviously uh, Korea is here, North Korea. And it's a fairly small country. Uh, we're, we're not talking about a, uh, a very large country, but we are talking about a country which sits in kind of an a, a in-between place. And so uh, it's ended up being a, 
contested territory for empires and influence over Korea has been a, uh, a matter of global interest for a very long time. Uh, secondly, and also part of the, the 20th century history, 20th century, of course, is when we invent nuclear weapons. Uh, and what happens almost immediately once we invent nuclear weapons is nuclear weapons begin spreading. Technologies spread, uh, and uh, weapons technologies tend to spread very quickly. And so the, as the weapons technology has spread, and people realized fairly quickly how troubling this was with regard to nuclear weapons, uh, the question of who should have these weapons and who shouldn't have these weapons becomes a, uh, a global conversation. And uh, North Korea has been part of these discussions for, for quite some time now. And its position on these discussions has a lot to do with its historical image of itself as a uh, embattled point on the map. And also uh, about the history of not just nuclear weapons and who has them, but also who doesn't have them and what happens to them, especially if they give up nuclear weapons. So I'll talk about that when I get a little, get a little further uh, down the line. Um, the story as I want to tell it begins in the late 1800s uh, at a time when China, the Qing Dynasty of China, uh, more or less the same borders as, as, as it shows here, uh, not entirely, but more or less the same borders as, as this, is one of the greatest empires in the world, but has spent the last half century or so getting beaten up on by the increasingly powerful and uh, increasingly aggressive uh, sea powers of the world, the, the great empires of the world in the 19th century. We we're talking about the British Empire. We are talking about the United States once it reaches the uh, California coast starts to become a Pacific Empire in the late 1800s. Uh, we are talking about the Russian Empire. Uh, we're, we're still talking about Russia at this point, not, not the Soviet Union. We'll get to them. Uh, and uh, the British, uh, of course, and the uh, French and Germans also have substantial uh, imperial possessions around the world, especially in places like Africa and increasingly in Southeast Asia. Korea has spent, in the late 1800s, has spent uh, the last 200 years approximately uh, having international relations with basically only China uh, and to a very limited extent trade and uh, economic relations with Japan. And has spent a fair bit of time and energy keeping Western ideas, including Christianity, from becoming important within Korea. And, and it's in the 19th century when foreigners, English and American uh, uh, ships, show up trying to open up trade with Korea, that Korea gets the uh, nickname the Hermit Kingdom, uh, the kingdom that wants to be isolated from, from the rest of the world. Well. In the 19th century, with rising sea powers uh, and, and the spread of uh, more or less global uh, empires, th this is not really sustainable. And uh, the United States sends a trade mission to Korea uh, and fails to open up relations in the 1860s. Uh, in the 1870s, Japan uh, opens up trade relations with Korea uh, on a modern basis. And Korea begins the process of entering into diplomatic relations with the rest of the world, including the United States, England, France, Russia, etc., and starting to worry about how it's going to handle being part of this new community of Im imperialist and industrialized states, and begins the process of uh, something which will occupy a good portion of the next 
a uh, couple of decades, which is trying to find very powerful allies who can keep them safe from all the other countries that are trying to take them over. Uh, their first choice in this case is China, uh, and so Korea maintains very strong diplomatic relations with China, but also economic and diplomatic relations with Japan, as well as the United States and a few other countries. And Japan increasingly starts to see Korea as uh, strategically important for its uh, international interests. Uh, the term that they use in the 19th century for uh, territories that are not yours but which you consider too important to let anybody else control is sphere of interest. Uh, and so the Japanese start considering Korea uh, as part of their sphere of interest in the 1870s. In the 1880s, uh, Korea uh, becomes a site of essentially small-scale skirmishes between embassy forces in, uh, of the Japanese and embassy forces of China and a number of other uh, open, open conflicts about who will have influence in Korea as it tries to consider how it's going to modernize itself. And the Koreans, again, uh, rely very heavily on China, but the influence of Japan is, is fairly strong. Now, Japan, by this point, is considered a model modernizing, industrializing, rising Asian power, and there are a number of Koreans who think that Japanese might be a useful, helpful power as well. Um, and in order to, to keep this conflict from becoming too intense, the... Japanese and the Chinese get together and negotiate how they will manage their relationship with Korea. Now, this is pretty standard 19th century imperialism, which is to say when China and Japan get together to manage their relationship with Korea, no Koreans are involved in the negotiation. They decide, uh, the Japanese... Prime Minister Ito Hirobumi, the Chinese Foreign Minister Li Hongzhang, decide that they will balance their influence in Korea. And they sign a treaty which says they will, neither one will send troops into Korea unless the other one gives permission and sends the same number of troops. And they will both work together to help Korea develop itself as a, as a modernizing nation. For a variety of reasons, um, the Japanese never really took this agreement too seriously and begin the process fairly quickly of trying to get more and more influence within the Korean court uh, and uh, eventually leverage a fairly large religious uprising in southern Korea into a reason to send troops into Korea, ostensibly to help the Koreans uh, deal with this uprising. The Chinese object to this and uh, threaten to send their own troops into Korea, whereupon the Chinese and the Japanese basically begin a war in 1894 over who will control Korea. Uh, the Japanese attack Chinese embassies uh, around, uh, around Seoul, uh, drive Chinese forces out of the country, and attack Chinese naval bases uh, in the Guangdong and the Aodong peninsulas, uh, as, uh, sorry, uh, Guangdong and, Xia, and Shandong peninsulas, uh, as a uh, way of, of keeping Chinese forces under, under control. And relatively quickly, uh, force the Chinese to surrender. Um, now this doesn't, in some ways, you, you look at the, the relative size of Japan, the relative size of China, uh, this is this may be a surprising result, but this was the 19th century and anybody who was anybody had had a war with China in which China had lost. Um, 19th century was not a good century for China. We can talk about that some other time maybe. Um, when the Chinese lose, uh, the Japanese and the Chinese again sit down to negotiate their, uh, the settlement to this, uh, and it involves the Chinese paying the Japanese uh, 
uh, for forcing them to fight this war. The Japanese actually make a profit on this war. The uh, Chinese also turn over certain territories to Japan, including Taiwan. Uh, this is how Taiwan becomes a Japanese colony uh, until 1945. And the Chinese agree that they will not involve themselves in Korean affairs, that Korea will be a Japanese sphere of influence from this, from this point forward as far as China is concerned. And again, no Koreans were involved in this negotiation. The Koreans are not thrilled about this for, I think, fairly obvious reasons, and immediately begin looking for another empire that can balance their rising influence of Japan against Korean interests. And since China didn't work out, they start talking to Russia. Russia has, in the late 19th century, a significant interest in expanding its power in the Pacific region. Uh, this is the period when the great Trans-Siberian Railroad comes into being. This is the period when uh, Russian influence in the Pacific region becomes uh, increasingly powerful. And Russia always felt a little bit like a second-rate power in Europe, definitely looking for ways to show that it's a real global power along with England and France, et cetera, et cetera. So the Russians begin working with the Koreans on modernization and um, development. But the Japanese are still there as well, uh, and also working with portions of the Korean court. And there's a, a sort of an internal battle within the Korean royal court over whose influence is going to be most powerful. Um, but Japan is, is really quite determined to uh, take control of Korea, and um, uh, one, one very powerful Japanese politician referred to Korea as a dagger pointed at the heart of Japan. Uh, tells you how critical they thought this was. So the, uh, at one point, actually, the uh, Japanese embassy staff assassinate the Korean queen. Uh, give you some idea of, of how violent these kinds of conflicts could be. They actually end up escaping back to Japan uh, and getting away with it. The Russians are moving troops and forces into northern China as part of uh, Russian development in Manchuria. The Japanese are a little nervous about this because it represents a potential threat to their influence in the region. And then in uh, 1900, you have the Boxer Uprising, which is a, a major uprising in uh, China, which produces a huge anti-foreign uh, revolution, essentially. Uh, eventually, eventually results in uh, a coalition of foreign countries sending troops into China in order to put down the Boxer Uprising, uh, including Japan, which, of course, being close, was the majority of the troops actually sent in. The Germans also sent troops. The Americans, the Russians, uh, the British, and the French were also involved. As part of the aftermath of that, the Japanese and Russians start having negotiations about who's going to have how many troops in northern China and in Korea. And the Japanese are firmly convinced that the Russians need to back off. Uh, the Russians, of course, uh, with influence in Korea with the Korean court and also economic interests in Manchuria, have no desire to back off. Uh, and eventually, uh, negotiations break down. And the Japanese decide uh, that it's time to go to war. So in, in 1904, the Japanese attack uh, Russian positions in the Korean capitals, Seoul and Pyongyang, uh, and also Russian uh, railroads and bases in uh, Manchuria. The um, most famous episode from this war is actually the sinking of the uh, Russian Baltic fleet. R Japan was at this point an ally of Great Britain, uh, which didn't mean that Great Britain was going to come to their aid, but it did mean that Great Britain had promised not to involve themselves in any conflict, uh, to remain neutral. And the way Great Britain interpreted this, because this was mostly about 
controlling Russian power, was that in the event of a war between Japan and Russia, Great Britain uh, would both help Japan with intelligence uh, and also uh, refuse to refuel or restock Russian ships that were trying to involve themselves in the conflict. So when the Russians put together a uh, fleet from the Baltic Sea and send it to try and lift the Japanese siege of Vladivostok, the fleet has to actually make it all the way around the world. This is the height of British sea power. This fleet has to make it all the way around the world, basically, uh, without the British knowing about it in order to get up to Vladivostok, uh, also without refueling at any British stations or ports, which is also fairly challenging. They do make it all the way to the Straits of Tsushima between Korea and Japan. By this point, the Japanese know that they're coming. Japanese fleet meets the Russian fleet in the Straits of Tsushima, and within about two hours, every ship in the Russian fleet is either sunk or in flames. So the Russians admit that they are not going to win this war, sit down to negotiate. The Japanese uh, actually uh, call for a neutral negotiator from a power that's capable of enforcing the agreement, and so they actually end up using Theodore Roosevelt as their negotiator uh, and doing the negotiations in Portsmouth. Uh, and the treaty which ends the war, the Portsmouth Treaty, turns over large portions of Russian economic interests in Manchuria to the Japanese. Uh, and it also, again, says that the Russians will not involve themselves in Korean affairs, leaves it as part of the Japanese sphere of influence. As a side agreement, uh, the uh, Japanese and the United States also enter into a, what's essentially a sphere of interest exchange in which the uh, Japanese acknowledge uh, United States control over the Philippines uh, in exchange for American recognition of Japanese interests in Korea. At this point, the United States, China, and Russia have all been basically removed from the equation. The Japanese go to the Koreans and say, we are the only empire that's really interested in you and we want to take a larger role in your affairs. And Koreans are not thrilled with this idea. But uh, the Japanese having demonstrated their military capacity, capacity excuse me, uh, the Koreans are not in a, in a terribly strong position to actually refuse. Um, there is a treaty signed between Korea and Japan at this point, which makes Korea a protectorate of Japan. Uh, now, there's a couple things about this. Uh, being a protectorate basically means that Korea is supposed to continue to manage its own internal affairs except for foreign affairs and military affairs. Those are supposed to be Japan's responsibility. This puts Korea in a, a difficult position. Um, they don't like this treaty. They did sign this treaty, although this uh, falls into the category of one of those treaties that was signed under duress um, and, and to some extent by force. And when I say by force, I mean there were guns in the room at the time that the treaty was signed. So the Koreans sign this Treaty of Protectorate and then immediately try to find a way out of it. Uh, but it turns out international law being what it was really uh, benefits the imperialist at this point because having signed the Treaty of Protectorate, Korea no longer has control over its foreign affairs, which means that no international court would recognize a Korean representative because it's Japan's job. So if anyone was going to challenge the treaty, it would have to be Japan. Obviously, they weren't interested. Over the course of the next five years, uh, Japan's control over Korea becomes uh, increasingly clear. In 1907, the Korean king abdicates his throne in uh, 
in favor of a, a non-monarchical government run by the Japanese, and the Korean army is disbanded. The Korean army almost immediately becomes a rebel group, uh, which will spend the next um, 10 years or so uh, making the Japanese have to fight for their control over Korea. The Japanese appoint a governor general over Korea as a protectorate, and this governor general is none other than Ito Hirobumi, uh, one of the most famous people in the process of Japanese modernization, uh, the writer of Japan's uh, first constitution, and one of Japan's first prime ministers, very distinguished, very important person. In 1909, uh, on a visit to uh, Harbin in uh, Manchuria, he is assassinated by a Korean nationalist. And by the way, you can find statues of this Korean nationalist in, uh, in several places in Korea. Uh, this, is, this is one of the few times in history I can think of where someone becomes a national hero by killing somebody else's national hero. Um, Shortly after that, and largely as a result of that, uh, the Japanese decide that a protectorate is really no longer the issue, and that what, Korea, what ha needs to happen to Korea is that Korea needs to become a fully integrated part of the Japanese empire rather than a separate state. Uh, and so in 1910, Japan and Korea are unified. Now Korea remains a second class member of this relationship, uh, there's no question about it. Uh, Koreans are technically Japanese citizens, but uh, in, in, in all kinds of legal and extra-legal ways, they are unquestionably second-class citizens. So the Japanese control over Korea continues, uh, despite continued Korean resistance, until 1945, basically. Um, and I'm skipping over a, a, a long and very painful history uh, for the Koreans of uh, Japanese attempts to eliminate Korean culture, Japanese attempts to, uh, well, successful attempts to, to reshape the Korean economy to serve Japanese needs, uh, and uh, the use of Korea as a jumping off point for development in China and further Japanese involvement in China and the use of Korean labor, uh, essentially forced labor uh, in Japan, especially as the 1930s progress and Japan is increasingly on a wartime footing. Suffice it to say, uh, Korea does not consider the imperial period, the colonial period, to be a good period in its history. Quite the opposite, obviously. The Progress of World War II doesn't affect Korea directly in a lot of ways. Not, none of the war is fought in Korea. But a lot of the war is fought in China, uh, and especially after 1931, when Japan controls large portions of Manchuria, North Korean industry is very much oriented towards serving Japan's needs in China uh, and uh, serving Japan's uh, personnel needs in China. A lot of Koreans end up in China working for, uh, working for the Japanese imperial forces or for Japanese companies. A number of Ch Koreans end up in China uh, working as anti-Japanese guerrilla warriors also, uh, into which category falls Kim Il-sung, who I'll introduce shortly, uh, who is the first and longest serving leader of North Korea. The other thing which is important to know about this time is that in 1917, there is a revolution in Russia. Uh, the Russian uh, imperial state falls and is replaced with a communist state uh, run by uh, Vladimir Lenin, uh, later on uh, Stalin, and uh, the intent of this revolutionary state, in addition to establishing a communist government within its own 
borders is to spread communism to the rest of the world. And uh, one of the ways in which they do this is by supporting anti-imperialist uh, forces in other parts of the world. Lenin, in particular, uh, had a fairly strong set of, of views on communism as an answer to imperialism, and a lot of anti-imperialists in the 1920s, 1930s, 1940s were heavily influenced by communism as a result. This includes a large portion of the Korean anti-Japanese guerrilla warriors in Manchuria, who had fairly close contact with both Russian uh, leadership in some cases, as well as Chinese communist leadership uh, later on. Japan's loss in World War II changes things. And in theory, should have made Korea uh, independent of imperial control. Part of, the, part of the, the, the whole point of World War II, at least in terms of the settlements after World War II, was establishing a uh, world in which empires were no longer part of the part of the equation. But because World War II was fought by the United States and the Soviet Union as allies, there are a number of places in the world where they try to balance their power against each other. The United States and the Soviet Union were not particularly friendly before World War II. Even during World War II, there are moments when they're not particularly friendly. And they both knew that after World War II was over, they were going to go back to being unfriendly towards each other once Japan and Germany and Italy were dealt with. So there is already, before World War II ends, some serious concern about how the Soviet Union, as a communist state which wishes to spread its power elsewhere, and the United States and, and Great Britain as uh, empires in their own right, uh, would, would balance their power against each other. And this results in, most famously, the division of Germany into East Germany under Soviet control and West Germany under British, French, and American control. West Germany is reunified into a single country, but East Germany remains separate uh, until um, 1989, basically. It also results in the division of Korea. The 38th parallel, the, the geographic line, was the, was the line of control. North of the 38th parallel, the Soviet Union, which of course borders Korea, uh, was the occupying power, the intent being to help the Koreans get, get uh, their feet under them again and then allow them to become independent. South of the 38th parallel is United Nations territory, technically, you know, mostly the United States, obviously. And as I said, the point was to allow Korea to become free from Japanese control and to establish itself as an independent government. Well, the North Korean provisional government and the South Korean provisional government each had very strong ties to their respective powers. And they discussed having national elections to decide who would be in charge of Korea. This is obviously a fairly reasonable thing. You have elections, someone takes control, and then the Soviets and the United States go away, and Korea can have a nice independent, uh, nice independent state. Unfortunately, the Soviet-controlled North Korean and the US-controlled South Korean governments could not agree on how to hold an election that would represent both sides fairly and openly. And so North Korea has an election in which, not surprisingly, uh, communist parties win uh, fairly substantial majorities. South Korea has an election in which, not surprisingly, anti-communist parties win fairly large majorities. In both cases, um, 
liberal nonpartisan parties uh, actually win substantial minorities, and in the event that there had actually been a full-born national election, it's probably true that neither the communists nor the anti-communists would actually have won. But that's not the way it worked. They have the elections, and then they begin basically yelling at each other across the line of control uh, about which one's elections are legitimate and which one's elections are not. The South Korean government, controlled by Syngman Rhee, uh, begins trying to protect itself from what it says are communist infiltrators and subversives by eliminating communists in South Korea, and by eliminating, I mean mostly shooting. North Korea begins a somewhat similar process of purging non-communists from positions of power, but it's the South Korean massacres is really the only word for it, uh, which gives the North Koreans the excuse they think they need to come across the line of control with military forces to settle the unification question once and for all. Uh, this begins, of course, uh, the process that we know as the Korean War. North Korean forces invade, uh, actually succeed in taking most of South Korea except for the uh, Pusan region. Uh, eventually, American forces come back in uh, behind North Korean lines, cut them off, push them back, uh, all the way up to almost the, the border with China, whereupon Chinese communist forces, volunteers technically, uh, come from China uh, and begin the process of pushing American forces back down. So we have essentially again Korea as a battleground between empires. Japan, I'm uh, sorry, uh, China and the Soviet Union on the one side and the United States, Great Britain, the United Nations on the other. The war is as we know, inconclusive. Uh, and eventually, the armistice line between the forces is uh, established. Now, it's worth pointing out, this has probably come up at some point in the, in the news, um, that while the Korean War is over, technically it's not. Uh, which is to say that we, we signed an armistice, which is a cessation of hostilities, but there never was a peace treaty. So there is technically a state of war still in, in, in existence on the Korean Peninsula. Just as another aside, the demilitarized zone uh, along this line is a couple of miles wide, and it's one of the most important and dangerous nature preserves in the world. Uh, between North Korean agriculture, which has been pretty devastating, and South Korean economic development, which has been, environmentally speaking, fairly aggressive. Uh, the DMZ is some of the only uh, untouched, unoccupied land in Korea, at least one of the largest chunks of it, um, but it is heavily landmined uh, as a way of providing a buffer against either side moving across the line in large numbers. This is, by the way, why the United States is not a party to the international treaty banning landmines. Because the United States military believes that the landmines in the DMZ are an important defense against possible North Korean incursions. Geographically speaking, the situation stabilizes uh, at this point. The North Koreans, with a very close alliance with China and with the Soviet Union, the South Koreans, a very close alliance with the United States, begin developing essentially independently. Now, not always peacefully, uh, and, and one of the less recognized components of this is that, especially through the 1960s, even into the 1970s, there were fairly regular incursions across the armistice line. Uh, the North Koreans, for example, like to dig tunnels under the demilitarized zone as a way of trying to insert guerrilla fighters into uh, 
uh, South Korea. Uh, there was also a very famous case in the 1970s uh, in which North Korean, um, well, spies basically, um, attacked the uh, South Korean president, uh, ended up killing the South Korean first lady uh, in the process. And there have been a number of other incidents, uh, firing of artillery across the line. Uh, American ships and planes have been fired at uh, on, on a few occasions, including the uh, capturing of the USS Phoenix uh, in the 1960s. There is still a, and has been for a very long time, a fairly tense situation. The South Koreans, continue to be closely tied to the United States for, for many years, still are, um, and the United States uh, supported South Korean governments uh, under Syngman Rhee, uh, uh, under uh, Pak, under Chun, uh, which were unquestionably authoritarian as well as anti-communist. The North Korean governments, though, uh, which are the, the, the ones that we're, we're focusing on, are built more on the Soviet and Chinese communist models. Uh, they are one-party states, and after um, the, the mid-1950s, uh, North Koreans begin doing something fairly similar to what the Soviets did under Stalin and what the Chinese did under Mao, uh, which is building what's called a cult of personality, in which the leader of the state, Kim Il-sung, becomes essentially synonymous with the nation. He becomes a symbol of the nation and becomes a... Uh, the, the, the only important person, basically, in the, in the government. And so there's a certain amount of mythology around Kim Il-sung um, as, uh, as a leader. He was, as I said, born in 1912. Um, he becomes head of the, uh, the North Korean government in 1948. In the... 1950s begins building this, this really strong one-party state, eliminating members of government even who he felt were insufficiently loyal to him particularly, uh, begins establishing a, uh, an ideology uh, known as juche, uh, which literally means independence or autonomy, uh, in which the uh, North Koreans claim to be a self-sufficient and independent state, uh, one which is uh, not beholden to any particular empires. Now, in this case, actually, of course, they remain fairly clearly beholden to China and to the Soviet Union as, uh, as their patrons. But the, the Juche ideology allows them to justify essentially closing off the state to outside influences and outside contacts. And over the course of the 1960s, especially, uh, North Korea becomes what is widely recognized to be one of the most closed societies in the world in terms of its relationships with the rest of the world, international trade, international travel, contacts, that sort of thing. Um, Technically, as a communist state or as a Juche state, because they eventually stop calling themselves communists and start calling themselves something else, uh, they're not supposed to be a monarchy. But nonetheless, uh, succession has passed from father to son uh, as, as time has gone on. Kim Jong-il, uh, born during World War II, probably in eastern Russia, it's not entirely clear. The, the official Korean mythology says he was born at, near Mount Pekdu, which is a fairly important mountain in Korean, uh, Korean sort of religious history. It's probably not true. Uh, he, his education was uh, largely in Russia, uh, Soviet Russia at the time. Uh, and he begins the process in the uh, 1980s of... 
being given government positions so that he can rise through the ranks and eventually become a successor to his father. Um, his father, Kim Il-sung, passes away in 1994, whereupon Kim Jong-il becomes the head of the Korean state. Well, technically, he waits three years before he takes his father's positions, uh, which is, uh, uh, interestingly enough, the traditional, Confucian tradition uh, in China and Korea, although they're not Confucian societies anymore particularly, was to mourn a parent for three years before moving on. So the, he follows the three-year waiting period before technically becoming head of state. Um, he oversees you know, in the mid-90s a series of attempts to create a more robust and independent economy which result in one of the most devastating famines in modern history. Uh, something, somewhere between 300,000 and 3 million Koreans die of starvation over the course of about five years. Um, given the fact that the North Korean population is at this point on the order of about 20 to 25 million, uh, you can see that this is a really dangerous, devastating situation. At this point, the reason that he's doing this is that in 1992, the Soviet Union ceased to exist. China is still communist, but has been moving away from being an international sponsor of communism over the course of the 1980s and 1990s. And so the idea that Korea needs to actually be a Juche state, an independent state, to stand on its own two feet becomes uh, increasingly important. This is also, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, when the North Korean nuclear weapons program begins to become increasingly active and uh, dangerous. This is also, and this is not unrelated, when the North Koreans begin aggressively developing new missile technologies based on Russian and Chinese technology that they'd been given during the Soviet era uh, and begin testing these missiles and exporting missiles technology to other states that want to buy it. Uh, this, is, this is one of the ways in which North Korea uh, technically, without having a lot of trade with the outside world, brings in outside money, uh, missiles technology, weapons technology. Uh, for a while, they were one of the major world producers of methamphetamine. Uh, and also, uh, the world's best forgers, uh, producing uh, fake $100 bills, so good that even uh, American Federal Reserve officials often couldn't tell the difference. Kim Jong-il begins the process of trying to groom his sons to be successors uh, in the, uh, well, early 2000s mostly. Uh, Kim Jong-nam, his actual eldest son, uh, ends up being exiled from Korea after he's arrested in Tokyo with a Dominican passport. He said he wanted to go to Disneyland. I'm not kidding, by the way. Uh, he ends up living in exile, and then, um, it was about two years ago, I guess, he ends up being assassinated in Malaysia, almost certainly by North Korean agents. So the next in line, uh, the next oldest uh, son is Kim Jong-un. Uh, he was born in the 1980s, educated in boarding schools in Switzerland uh, in the 1990s, and then after he graduates from that, comes back, spends some time in college in China, and then uh, begins the process of taking on military offices uh, and rising up through the ranks fairly rapidly, as the son of the dear leader tends to. Um, 
it's, we often talk about Kim Jong-un as being really young and inexperienced. Uh, it, it is worth noting that he does have about 10 years of experience in the, uh, in the, the Korean military as he's rising up through the ranks. So he's not completely disconnected from politics uh, or from power at that point. Um, when Kim Jong-il dies in 2011, Kim Jong-un then becomes the head of the state uh, and is, uh, uh, that's the point at which he decides that his older brother has to be killed. And this is more or less where we are now. The one thing which all three of these leaders have in common, uh, aside from being members of the same family, is that they spend an immense amount of time and energy protecting themselves from political enemies, real and imagined. Uh, in addition to creating a closed information ecosystem, I guess you could say, uh, in which only North Korean propaganda essentially is the available information within the country, uh, Kim Il-sung, uh, once he took power, spent years weeding out anyone he thought was a possible threat to his power or a possible successor. Kim Jong-il, when he takes control, spends uh, years getting rid of anyone his father relied on too, too heavily so that they can't be a threat to his power. And Kim Jong-un reportedly, having taken control in 2011, uh, has spent the last five years eliminating what he saw as potential threats to his power from people that his father relied on too heavily for political purposes. They are terrified, as near as we can tell, of information coming into the country which conflicts the official view of the world. They are uh, incredibly sensitive to the possibility of subversive ideas and teachings, uh, which is why, for example, if you go to Korea and accidentally leave a copy of a Bible in your hotel room when you leave, you can be imprisoned. Christianity is one of those foreign influences that they consider to be a problem. Interestingly enough, South Korea is the second most Cre Christian country in, Na in Asia, uh, following the Philippines, which of course is Spanish Catholic territory for centuries. Uh, but North Korea, uh, South Korea has a uh, very large, uh, primarily Protestant, uh, but not entirely, uh, Christian population, uh, uh, which is a result of a combination of American missionary activity, Christianity being seen as an alternative to Japanese imperialism, intellectually and culturally speaking, uh, and then after Korea, South Korea becomes independent, uh, Christianity just becomes increasingly popular as, as time has gone on. It's not entirely clear whether it's because it's Western that the Kims consider it a threat to North Korean culture or whether it's because it has ties to South Korea, but either way, uh, Christian missionary activity is, uh, is forbidden. Korea continues to think of, North Korea continues to think of itself as embattled, surrounded. Um, this is a, 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 some of the U.S. military forces in the, in the vicinity. Uh, almost 40,000 for, uh, troops of, vari of various varieties in Japan. Almost uh, 30,000 troops in South Korea. Um, Okinawa, of course, a uh, major uh, U.S. Marine base, forward operating base. Uh, Guam, which has been in the news recently, uh, which has a fairly critical uh, base. The U.S. used to have a base in the Philippines uh, and, and uh, does not anymore. Um, and, of course, American, uh, I, 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 unfortunately, it's not on this map, but Hawaii is about here, which, of course, has the Pearl Harbor base and a few others. 
So there is a substantial U.S. military presence in East Asia, uh, in the Western Pacific. Now, China, which is still a uh, patron state of North Korea, obviously, is large, it is powerful, uh, it is a regional superpower at the very least, and they have very mixed feelings about their North Korean client state on a fairly regular basis. Um, they like the fact that North Korea is a buffer for China between the Chinese border and the South Korean uh, forces, which are, of course, an uh, ally of the United States. They like the fact that North Korea pays attention to them. Uh, there are certain economic reasons why their relationship with North Korea is important. But they really don't want the situation to change. They like stability. That's a very broad statement, but uh, if North Korea, if, if the North Korea and South Korean balance ever, ever loses uh, its integrity and an actual conflict happened, of course, this would put China in the same position it was in during the Korean War with a war basically on its border which involves the United States. Uh, and this is not something that the Chinese have any uh, interest in experiencing. So in this context, the North Koreans see themselves as still at war, still threatened regularly. Uh, South Korea and the United States have annual military exercises. North Korea spends the entire time basically screaming about how they're being threatened and uh, how the exercises are targeted at them and it's an it's a aggressive stance and occasionally uh, firing, firing, whoops, firing artillery across the, across the border to uh, make their point. So they see themselves as, as still threatened, still, still surrounded by empires, still trying to balance China uh, and to some extent Russia, uh, their allies, against the other empires around them. And so the, the experience from the 19th century to the present of Korea basically being a poker chip in the great game uh, continues to be very relevant. Let's talk about the nuclear weapon question. The United States develops the atomic bomb in 1944-1945 with British help. The Soviet Union uh, follows fairly shortly uh, developing its own atomic bomb, although to some extent with stolen American technology. The British and the French follow almost immediately as well, developing their own atomic bombs, uh, in the case of the British obviously with American help, in the case of the French to some extent with American help, but mostly, mostly on their own. Uh, a number of other countries begin developing atomic weapons as well. Uh, China which has, of course, a very close relationship with Russia in the 1950s, asks the Russians to share their nuclear weapons technology, and the Russians say, the Soviet Union says, yes, okay, fine, we will share this technology, but they really didn't want to. So they spent a couple of years letting Russian scientists work with Chinese scientists, telling them as little as possible for as long as they could get away with it. Eventually, in 1959, the Chinese realized they're not getting anywhere, uh, kick the Russian scientists out, break off relations with the Soviet Union over that and a few other issues, uh, and use the technology they've gotten from the Soviet Union along with uh, you know, what technology they can develop themselves to develop their own uh, nuclear weapons. A number of other countries uh, begin the process of following suit. Um, I don't know. If you, a little, it's a little hard to see, but in the 1960s, uh, in addition to France, Spain, Great Britain, 
parts of Scandinavia, you also have South Africa, you also have um, Egypt, Israel, uh, and Brazil and Argentina uh, as states that were developing or had developed nuclear weapons. Eventually, people realize that nuclear weapons may be bad. I don't know, there's no other way to put it, really. Uh, and that maybe everybody having nuclear weapons would not be a good thing. And so over the course of the 1960s, 1970s, we begin developing uh, arms limitation treaties uh, in which uh, the United Nations and the Soviet Union, the United States, a few other countries, begin the process of trying to scale back nuclear weapons technology and uh, reduce proliferation, uh, reduce the spread of weapons to other states, the fear being that eventually nuclear weapons would get into the hands of an irresponsible state if too many people had them. This is uh, circumstances under which Brazil and Argentina, for example, give up their nuclear weapons. Uh, now, there's a, that happens relatively early. Australia gives up its nuclear weapons, there's a few others. And then things stabilize for a little while. And as new states begin developing nuclear weapons, uh, India and Pakistan, for example, uh, which see themselves as balancing each other out with, uh, with these weapons, um, Israel, uh, which, like North Korea, sees itself as surrounded by hostile powers uh, and sees nuclear weapons as a way of balancing the odds, <coughs> excuse me. Um, these, the, the global shift away from spreading nuclear weapons towards giving them up begins to affect some of the other sort of marginal states uh, that have weapons. And there's a, a, a kind of an interesting pattern to this, which North Korea doesn't talk about, but which I think is, is fairly, has to be in their minds. Uh, now, North Korea has been engaged in non-proliferation talks and disarmament, nuclear disarmament talks since we discovered they had an active nuclear program. This is not actually a new thing. Uh, we, 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 uh, the program kicks into high gear, basically, almost immediately with the fall of the Soviet Union in the early 1990s. Almost immediately, the United States begins negotiating with North Korea uh, in order to try and convince them to give up their nuclear program and their missiles development programs. But this is, as I said, the same time that because of the collapse of the Soviet Union uh, and because of changes that are happening in China, North Korea increasingly feels the need to develop its own weapons, develop its own economic strength, and also to be able to protect itself. While this negotiation is happening, and I'll talk about the course of that in a minute, uh, a number of other states are giving up their nuclear weapons programs, or in some cases, their uh, chemical and biological weapons programs. And the most important cases, I think, uh, the ones that are, are the most sort of obviously troubling, would be South Africa. Uh, it's, it's, I'm not sure why. Uh, the, it's, it's on a recently terminated program because it happened in the uh, late 80s, early 90s. Um, but South Africa, which was a white-controlled minority state in Africa. Uh, apartheid is the term. I realize I have to define that now because I grew up hearing it, but uh, a, lot of people, a lot of people here didn't. Um, the apartheid state had developed nuclear weapons, partially as a result of fear of incursions into nearby territory by Cuba and other Soviet allies. But in the late 1980s, early 1990s, the government gives up its nuclear weapons, uh, surrenders them to the international community, dismantles its nuclear weapons development uh, 
uh, facilities. And perhaps coincidentally, perhaps not, the white-led minority government collapses and a uh, African majority uh, government, an uh, actual democratic system, uh, is put in place. I'm not saying that there's an exact relationship between these things, but the chronology is kind of interesting. Second example, Libya. Uh, Libya had a minimal nuclear weapons program. Uh, actually, I was doing a little research for this, and I found that they did have nuclear weapons technology, but apparently they didn't really understand it, and they gave it up basically saying, look, we've got this stuff. We don't know what to do with it. Uh, we might as well just give it up. Uh, they also give up their chemical weapons uh, technology, uh, weapons of, of mass destruction and poisoning uh, also. And almost immediately upon entering into an agreement and beginning the process of dismantling their chemical weapons industry, Libyan government collapses. Iraq runs into trouble with the United States in the uh, early 1990s. After having spent the 1980s using chemical weapons against Iran, as well as against, uh, in some cases, uprisings of its own people. As part of the settlement of the first Gulf War, the United States, the United Nations, insists that Iraq give up its chemical weapons, weapons of mass destruction programs. Iraq mostly complies, uh, and basically at the point where they have almost completely surrendered these programs and allowed inspections to take place. The United States decides it's not good enough, invades the country, and destroys the government. So we have a pattern of states giving up their weapons of mass destruction programs and then failing almost immediately. Now, I'm not saying there's necessarily a cause and effect relationship here. This, this needs a great deal more study uh, and, and attention, I think. But I do not think the North Koreans are unaware of this, because in all of the negotiations over the last, we're, we're going on almost 25 years now, in all of the negotiations with regard to nuclear weapons technology, North Korea has insisted one of the non-negotiable components of these negotiations has been that the world needs to recognize North Korea's right to nuclear weapons as a means of defense, even if it is giving them up in practice. Even if it is willing to give up its nuclear weapons, and it's not entirely clear that it ever actually was willing to give up its nuclear weapons, although it has occasionally been willing to to, to move aside from its uh, nuclear weapons development. The idea that they could be considered vulnerable is deeply disturbing to the various and sundry Kim family regime that have been involved in this, uh, involved in this process. So in 1994, after the, their first nuclear weapons program is discovered, the United States and North Korea and a few other countries agree on a framework for denuclearizing uh, North Korean weapons systems in exchange for nuclear reactor technology that cannot be used for nuclear weapons, uh, as well as other energy assistance and a few other concessions. Unfortunately, uh, Japan backs out of the deal because the North Koreans continue to develop missile technology, which the Japanese consider to be very threatening, fairly obviously. Uh, North Korean missile tests go over Japan pretty regularly, and this is not, there's other reasons why this isn't a friendly relationship, but North Korea will never let Japan forget about the imperial period, I assure you. So, so there's no, no love there. The United States, drags its feet through the 1990s on funding the nuclear reactor development and uh, the fuel oil assistance and things like that. And eventually, uh, the, the whole process breaks down in 2002, possibly as a result, or at least in, at around the same time, that 
President George W. Bush declares North Korea a member of the axis of evil, along with uh, Iran and Iraq. Um, at that point, the North Koreans step up their nuclear weapons development as well as continuing their negotiations with regard to nuclear weapons development. There's been a lot of back and forth. It gets kind of complicated. Uh, but the short version is, in spite of the fact that negotiations were ongoing and occasionally seemed to have been reasonably successful, in 2006, the North Koreans tested what appears to be their first successful nuclear weapon. Negotiations break down almost immediately, of course, at that point, uh, and a whole new process of negotiation and re-engagement re uh, has to happen. The, the consistent problem with these negotiations, it seems to me, and I'm not a, a diplomat, uh, but the North Koreans walk into the negotiations basically saying, we need certain concessions, including the Americans getting out of Korea so that they're not threatening us, uh, and uh, recognition of our right to defend ourselves by any means necessary. The Americans walk into the negotiations saying, the only non-negotiable thing we have here is that you have to agree to give up nuclear weapons. And since neither side will admit before negotiations begin that they're willing to give up everything, these negotiations repeatedly go nowhere. So the history of North Korea is the history of imperialism in the 20th century, it's the history of the Cold War, which is also a kind of imperialism in the 20th century. It is the history of nuclear weapons in the 20th century, which, in spite of the fact that this is the 21st century, all of which remains very relevant. Thank you. I, I realize I've, I'm actually closer to out of time than I expected, but uh, I'm happy to answer questions if people have questions. Thank you.